Thank you for joining us. My name is Adrienne Miel. I am the Community Services Coordinator at CDCI, and I am so excited today to have our guest, Matthew LaFleur, joining us. Matthew, do you mind introducing yourself? Thank you, Adrian. Yes, my name is Matthew LaFleur. I live from Auburn, Vermont, in Grand Isle County, the last town before Quebec, Canada, and New York. Ross's Point, New York. Excuse me. I use pronouns he, him. I live with family. Uh, my occupation is city of Vermont statewide, 15 to 16, probably to be determined. Committees across Vermont. Uh, I work, you know, as an advisor, a, a council member, and a committee member, and a commission member. My work is very, very complex across the state of Vermont, but I do it for uh, just the individual access need of the person. And uh, I try to make sure that their access need is met fully by the ADA, American with Disability Act law, but also as an individual uh, to make sure that everybody, you know, has a right to, to the way of life in the Green Mountain State that they care and love about. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, Matthew. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the work that you have become involved in, and we're so happy to have you on the CDCI Community Advisory Council right now. Um, but I want to ask you a little bit about growing up. And so my first question is, have you always been a doer? You seem to be very yeah. involved. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, when growing up, you know, I always had the notion of being a doer, not at first. I thought I would take the, you know, just step back and let someone else do it to take charge. See where that would have, you know, brought me to or where that would go. But in life, I say to get things done, you know, and I had to, you know, self-advocate for myself and my family and try to be a role model for children, families uh, across, you know, the state, but also in my own, you know, circumstances, you know, is try to, you know, be better at, you know, trying to communicate to other people, try to understand people in their way, try to figure out what I truly want. And what I truly want is, you know, the collaboration and cooperation of individuals, no matter what background they're from. Because what I see is, you know, in my life is if I don't collaborate or Con keep in contact with individuals in my life, uh, then nothing will get done. And um, as you know, as for the question, as as for me being a doer, I take this very very seriously because there's people out there uh, that don't take their job very very seriously. And I want to show people, show it, but uh, see what they do, not what they say. Um, approach you know to my work because anything less of you know it's just plain lip service not true and um i don't like giving lip service to people i think you know for me in my life i think <clears throat> being true to myself and my um way of looking at you know uh of what I can offer is to be my authentic self in that process is the best way to serve the community of Vermont statewide. Thank you for answering that question. Thanks, Matthew. Um, so we've just mentioned that we're both in Vermont right now, and I know you do a lot of work across the state. So I'm wondering, what are some things that you like about living in Vermont? Well, thank you for answering that question. What I like about living in Vermont is uh, the snow. Huh. As you may know, uh, winter weather is very, very, you know, breathtaking to myself and my family. It's just been, you know, a miraculous sight to, you know, to experience. Yes, it's cold, wet, and heavy. Sometimes, you know, it's a chore to have to, you know, do, clean your driveway, snow blow your driveway, do, you know, do it by hand, but it's also very beautiful that um, I'd be able to experience it firsthand. And 
that is one aspect, you know, one part of what I like Vermont is that winter, that, that beautiful winter, beautiful beauty that everybody, you know, likes here. Another part, another part of, you know, the reason why I like coming to Vermont, it's, um, it's, you know, a small state, which, you know, it's not as crowded. It's more open, open free. It has, you know, some advantages there of, you know, of, you know, why it's so free. It, it has a better health, health advantages among other states. But also it has, you know, the nature of why it called a Green Mountain State of Vermont. It's that nature aspect, you know, that people come to live and enjoy. And uh, it's quiet. So on days, so it's like, you know, for me, that's very peaceful. Number three, which I like about the Vermont, you know, that stands out uh, among others, it's the democracy of Vermont, how it's being, you know, voting rights, you know, and how it's being, you know, run, you know, there are some progress moving forward, but for all in all, it's done pretty good so far. And voting rights, you know, are individual rights. So, and individual rights are disability rights. So it, it, all, it all works together. I think Vermont has, you know, shown the nation that everybody has the right to vote no matter what. And um, I think in a democracy, which is under attack from extremists, you know, across the nation, I think Vermont has done pretty, pretty good on protecting individual rights. So that's number three of why Vermont stands out among the rest. Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. Um, so in ex telling your story uh, a little bit, I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about what school was like, what it was like growing up, um, and sort of when you came to Vermont. Good. Thank you, Andrea, for asking that question. Um, let's start off about my livelihood when I grew up. I actually w did not live here in Vermont. I actually lived in the state called Iowa. They call it that state for a reason. As a state that I, you know, was forced living there growing up, I was an orphan. Uh, me and my twin brothers were orphan. Um, our birth mother, not our adopted mother, our birth mother was a heavy user on drugs and was partying an all out partier all night so we don't even know who the father is at this point all we know she was you know living her life at this point with me and my with me and my twin brother and her you know womb at this point <clears throat> she did drugs that affected me and my brother uh cognitively you know adhd uh fetal alcohol syndrome born preemie premature uh and then from that point, uh, we actually had safe haven with an Amish family, which was in Kelowna, which took us in until we were adopted by my true mother and father, which, you know, was very, very, you know, they wanted us since day one. And uh, we've been living with them ever since, you know. But for all in all, um, my growing up there was, you know, it, it was, you know, it was a challenge, you know, it was, uh, it was, you know, I wouldn't sit there and say it was the best, but that's how I all, all I remember was, you know, growing up there, then me and my family moved from Iowa to Vermont uh in 1994 1995 was actually physically in vermont but 1994 is when we moved 1993 is when we we started our move made our tracks way here our m movement here so 1995 was actually when we actually set settled down here uh and we've been in st albans vermont you know for one year and we've been in Alberg ever since, which is, you know, for 26 years. So one year in St. Albans, then we moved to our permanent home as we currently live. 
in Grand Isle County for about 26, 27 plus years. And um, growing up in Vermont in the school system uh, was, uh, I should say for me, was so-and-so. Uh, my town currently, as you may know, Alberg has that still same, it still was then when it still was, is now. They've done better, but uh, the resources and tools in Alberg for the special education when I grown up at the time was none. There was none available. And plus it was, you know, very, very, the atmosphere changed tremendously in the school system for me and my brother. I felt very, very tense the first t- couple of times I was there because I was the only, per- me and my brother were, were twin brothers. Me and my brother were the only, you know, person of color there at the school. So it was tense already. And uh, was it welcoming? I, w- I wouldn't say that it was welcoming. I would say that it was challenging. It was hard for the staff to understand individuals with disabilities. Uh, and they still have that problem to this day. There's nothing I could do about that, but there's nothing I could do about currently to this day about what's going on in that school system. Everybody knows that school system, with special education is not as good as where it should be. Uh, but back then there was no, lack of, there was none. So um, growing up in a town, in the state, you know, for the first time, it was challenging because uh, being a person, for a town that's mainly white, having two black kids, you know, and you know, in this town was very, very nerve wracking, and it was very, very hard to tell other communities that my mom and dad are white. They adopted us, but they were wondering why did we adopt two black kids, and um, it was just, you know, it was just how it was perceived as. So we took it as any other person would took it with respect, you know, and said, they're just curious. And that's all we did was it, Vermont's a curious state. <clears throat> Whereas I was more full blown racist and they put the R in racist big time because they would literally go after you. And um, I think Vermont has done a lot better than my home state of Iowa has ever would have done. And it's, you know, and in my life, in my life span, actually. But thank you for answering that question. Thank you, Matthew, for sharing. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if the, the adversity, that tenseness that you felt has had a role in shaping your interest in the work that you do today. Do you think that growing up in a small town and facing some of these challenges has um, influenced why you became an advocate? Yes, and yes. Yes, it does. In certain ways, it does, you know. But I was looking at the overall picture of what Vermont could become if it, you know, if ever, you know, if there was any, you know, decency of changing its ways, you know. There's still work in progress. But it's now it's being now it's being taken notice. You know, now Vermont's taking notice that they gotta really change their tone right here very quickly. Because there's a lot of people that can't afford this type of rhetoric and or cannot afford this way of life of, you know, being a person of color, living in a white, living in a white state that still centerized its system around a white culture and white privilege. Which, you know, to me it's like it's still to this day. To this day, I'm still fighting with that because it's a big challenge. And it ain't just advocacy, but I'm not just doing it for myself and my brother, but I'm also doing it for, you know, uh, the people that don't, the voiceless, the people that may have a voice, but they can't speak or do not have a voice and can't speak at all, you know. And so what I see is, you know, not just self-advocacy to myself, self-advocacy, uh, obviously for others, but in my work is very, very complex, you know, to this day it's complex because 
to me, it's like, it seems like the ones that want, want to do the hard work are put in that position to do, 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 do the hard work. But they understand the system the way it is. It's just other people just let other people. And it's not, not understanding that I like this, you know, opportunity. But it's no fair. Or why should we, we we be doing this now when other people before us could have done it? That's the point. Which that that confuses me the most. Is yes, there are people here that could have done it before I did? Could take this up and actually let with it. That could actually make positive changes within their communities. But it feels like you know I'm not, I'm not going to touch this because I can see this as of in some views of the political spectrum of the state. You know. It could be a negative. They could lose points if they were to help out. You know, they they could it could in their careers and you know how Vermont is. If it's if it brings out positive in their numbers, they'll do everything they can. But if it brings out negative, they're not going to touch it. And uh, this should never have been you know left to the public. This should have been taken care of well before then. It should have been taken care of in the 1900s, in my opinion, because we still see to this day in my work white advantages in a system which i'm not saying all people are that are in vermont are white and to go against it i'm just saying that's how vermont was built and there's people out there that just are afraid of changing it because they're afraid of the backlash or they're afraid of their political career and I hate to tell you this it's not all about political it should never be about political it should be about doing the right thing and if you're intentionally doing harm to communities out there that are telling you to change the system because they see something wrong here just change it and uh to me it's like i gotta continue to fight for acceptance equity inclusion diversity and in a sense of belonging for other people because vermont is the place to lay down roots here to have that sense of belonging and to thrive in Vermont when possible. And right now it's <clears throat> being catered to, and this is what I see, it's being catered toward the ableistic, the people that can, but you know what? It takes everyone to collaborate together to survive. And to me, it's like, I gotta continue to push that, that message that collabor collaboration and collectiveness, but collaboration is the key to su Vermont survival. If we cannot collaborate, then we're done. We There's no if, ands, or buts. There's nothing to talk about. We are done. And I can't see it that way. I see Vermont better than it is now. I see Vermont better than other states in the future if it gets there. I see Vermont lead the way in certain things. It's just, you know, it just takes... It just takes heart of someone that's a friend, a brother, a nephew, someone to look up to, someone to understand, someone to get to know, someone to really have conversations with. I'm all that because, you know, I see you as an individual. I don't see you as some check, something to write off so quickly. I see you as a person in your own world that wants to make a difference for others across Vermont, but also across the nation. And that's who we should be, the true Vermonters of the Green Mountain State of Vermont. We should be true to ourselves and to be, uh, be our authentic selves when we're doing those type of work together. Thank you for answering that question. Thank you, Matthew. Um, I know that equity and inclusion are really the center of your work, and I really appreciate um, how you how you remind us that the voices of of people of color in Vermont, of Vermonters with disabilities, are so important to um, all of the strategy that the state has to make this state a more welcoming. Um, place for different people to belong. And I wonder as a advocate who works on policy, I know you're involved in many committees across the state. Um, what advice do you have when people feel frustrated with the slow pace of change? Because I know, as you said, it's very hard 
<laughs> to to keep up your energy in some of this really challenging work. Andrea, thank you for answering that question. I'm gonna tell you this for my dad, and it's you know he he's he's a veteran, a military veteran. It's there there is a saying is it's you know the military is like too I mean, there's a saying is you know it's like too slow to hurry up or something like that way. It just, you know, and their version of it is, you know, they don't mind you, you know, recruiting very quickly, but to pay you, it, it takes a long time, slow time to, you know, fix some certain things then. And that aspect, and that aspects, you know, and for a veteran, of, I'm very proud of him, what he does to serve his country. And, you know, to me, it's like, that's the challenge that we have here. We're almost, you know, we're almost going like we're going too slow at this point. We're at a standstill and we shouldn't be at a standstill. We should be keeping up with the rest of the other states of but not just the society but the other states of the nation and right now we're getting we're getting beat left and right by them to the point that we're not um competitive enough and it's very very challenging and frustrated for me to understand a system that it sees it one way i mean it's it's meant for a college student i'm not a college student i'm a homeschooler I didn't ha have, I didn't have that uh, chance, you know, in life, you know, it, it is who I am, you know, I can't change, turn back the clock and change things. It just, it's who I am. It's my identity. And I'm not going to change myself or modify myself to be something else, you know, and, you know, if you have to change yourself to be something else, you know, then where is your sense of value after that? Where do you stand after that? Where do you live after that? How do you connect with people after that? It is, you know, with the challenges that I'm facing across my work, and it is tiresome, it's, it, it, it's no joke. It, it, it's to the point that, you know, that at the end of the day, I don't want to see people access need met. I want to make sure that no one has a big on their hands and knees just to get the simple access, you know? And uh, to me, it's like, it's very, very frustrating and challenging with the commi committee that I'm on because they're all seeing it in, in, in an advanced language, in a language that is meant for college students to get, no one else. No baby boomers, the voters, you know, the ones that really do vote. Uh, it's not meant for equity, anyone of color to understand. English learners, it's not meant for that. It was meant for one side. And Vermont has, you know, traditionally seen it one side. And uh, and we're starting to see that play out. Or in my com committees across Vermont, playing out very frequently that Vermont system is pandering to one side. Utter is my way or the highway. And Vermont is, you know, has that notion that we do it one way and one way only. And uh, to me, it's like that's, that's extremely frustrating because not everybody learns that way. Not everybody does that thing that way. Me and you both know not everybody acts that way either. We, are, we are all have our individual mindset. We are all individuals that do things, learn things, do things different. Not just do things differently, but act things differently and how we live. We are not, and this one thing that even makes me even more frustrating is we are not machines to the system. We are our own individual, or our, we are our own individual and our own individuality. We think for ourselves, not the way the system of Vermont says. And to me, it's like, you know, we're getting off topic of what Vermont truly is for members and its communities. And that's not the way to go about things. Because it's basically saying in, <clears throat> saying individuals, communities out there that uh, to be able to survive in Vermont, you have to learn only one way, and that's our way, not your way, our way. That's not how Vermont should act toward its constituents or its members. Thank you for answering that question. Thank you, Matthew. I know that um, that accessibility to the different systems in Vermont is very important to your work. And I know that we've talked a lot about access to work and people being able to um, make a livable wage and afford to live um, in our communities. 
I wonder if you would mind sharing a little bit more about what it's been like for you um, putting together the work that you do um, and, you know, finding jobs in Vermont. To me, that's, you know, it's hard. Oh, my work. Oh, my workforce, my work life experience. Oh, where should I begin? <laughs> my, e my easy, my first one, I'm going to let you know my, e my easiest one where, you know, I wish if I could get back there. Is childcare of Vermont. I'm actually very comfortable in that setting. I'm actually like taking care of children. I not only like teaching children, but I take care of them like a mother would have. True, a true mother would have. Uh, because you know, I can learn from them and they can learn from me. It goes both ways. It's not just it doesn't go one way, it goes both ways. The learning experience and uh Child care for me was actually the first job that I ever took up, you know, had, you know, it was a volunteer, but you know what, it was, you know, a job. It was, you know, getting out, getting outside the house, trying to, you know, see where my place belongs, you know, what can I do to serve communities? And uh, to me, it's like, you know, that was one of my first jobs that I really, truly love and care about because, I like interacting with children <laughs> and they like interacting to this day. They like interacting with me and, you know, they wonder where I'm in, am every day. Uh, it's just, you know, um, because I still help out actually in my local library up here. I continue to help out with play group, which is an age from, you know, two to five. And uh, they, to this day, they still wondering where I am. So uh, that's, you know, a great honor to work with the, you know, little people, little, little people, or, you know, and actually get to see and understand where they're coming from in their lives. And uh, that's one of the best, you know, work life that I would like to enjoy. Uh, and I'm still working in that currently. No, I'm not because the way the system of Ryan is, it's just, you know, biases in the system. And it's, and it's being pointed toward the community of color, literally. Um, I'm not the only one. There's other people that Love to do this job for pennies, you know, on a dollar, which I was getting paid nothing but pennies on a dollar for it. But I didn't, but I didn't look at that back then as a pay. I looked at that as being respected for who I am, not what I am. And uh, that's how I look at that job was. Then there's other childcare jobs that were, you know, actual childcare jobs, which I still loved it. Um. Couple of them were one was in Swanton, which was Montessori, which was was a Montessori school, which closed down. A retired teacher, she retired. She's been doing it since the nineteen sixties, uh, so it, it was due for her to you know to to retire. The child care experience has been positive for me in my life. It just you know Vermont is strict on rules, and I keep on making it more stricter. So me getting in that field is you know. It's just a dream, but I don't think re in reality I'm gonna get there. You gotta, you gotta roll the punches as they say it, and uh, it is something that you know I love to get back into, but not at this moment. Um, and answer to your other question, you know, how was my work life? You know, had been. Then I went to gas station. I went to work for a gas station. Then I went for which is retail. Then I went to a Walmart, which is also retail, the one in St. Albans when it was open. Uh, it was, you know, it was some work experience. I liked some of that experience, but it got to me. It's like I quitted that. It got it got old for me very, very quickly. And it just, you know, wasn't I wasn't comfortable in it. It was, you know, it wasn't my passion. My passion is to help people and um, those were except for the child care that was that's where it lies and those were just tryouts i would just want to try just to try out and that's it i just want to try it and see how i can make it and you know what there's your weaknesses and there's strong points in the work life and those were my weaknesses except for the child care those re retail area was my weakness because i did everything right it's just not not in their standards, and it's not as fast, not as fast as they want me to be in there, and which retail is fast. It's like, put it up as quick as you can. Don't bother if it's in a wrong place, which in my mind is, you gotta place it in the right place 
for the customer to get, but you know how retail is. Do it, put up quick, don't ask questions. And uh, that was pretty much, you know, my work of life. To this day, I'm unemployed. You know, it ain't just because of my disability. If just, you know, there's no job out there, you know, that would work for me. And I and I do see in the near future that when it comes to time, you know, that there just actually is a need for inclusion, diversity, acceptance of individuals, you know, of all backgrounds, regardless whether they have disability or not, that can be included in the workforce. I think that's when I see positivity changing. Positivity and optimism is changing across the state of Vermont. We know us very well that individuals with disabilities work their butts off, you know, to just to get notice, just to take notice, you know, just to get approval. And that's how the Vermont looks at it as. They don't look at it as a regular, me and you are working our butts off. Oh, you get praises because you're a regular employee. No, people with disabilities have to work extremely hard just to get approval. And that is not right. That's not okay. I should be treated as the same individual like me and you as a regular work colleague, not something less of. And if I don't have a job, like I said, my job is right now is to be be able to help other people, even if it's just this now and other commissions that have accepted me for who I am, not what I am. And the work that I do so hard to this day, if you call this work, um, it just, it's a, it's a great accomplishment in my mind that I accomplished something that I wanted so long in life was to help other people feel wanted, feel included, have a sense of belonging, but also feel like they can contribute in his or her way to the society, not what the state has to say. Thank you, Matthew, for for answering a question that I know is really hard and really emotional. Um, and I know we've talked about how you're a doer, but it's clear to me also how much you are a learner and approach all these experiences to learn from them as well um, and to take that as you teach others. And I know that a lot of these these systems, which are not inclusive enough and, and don't... Um, offer possibilities um, to everyone are issues that we have at our state and throughout our country. Um, and I, I know that recently you and I both had the opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. as part of your work with the Community Advisory Council and to advocate um, with some of our representatives. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how it's been starting up with the CDCI's Community Advisory Council I know you've worked on other advisory boards before, but um, could you share a little bit about what your first year has been like? Um, thank you for answering the question. And yes, I definitely enjoyed going to Washington, D.C. I already knew what I was doing, and if you knew what I was doing, and you already knew where I was going with that, uh, because I've been there before. It was, you know, like I said, I've been there three months ago earlier, so for the farm bill, 20, uh, no, lobbying for the 2024 farm bill, which means we had to talk to our local representatives, you know, of, you know, Vermont, you know, about how to advocate, not just advocate, but actually succeed in lobbying for that farm bill, which is, has a lot in that, you know, template of what, you know, Vermont wants to see, like, you know, aggregation culture, you know, try to aggregate some of these cultures, you know, just, you know, farming, you know, of the land, trying to help farmers, you know, you know, survive in Vermont. Um, yeah, but what helped me, you know, was, you know, of starting out with the CDCI was, you know, and how has it been? It's been, you know, it's been, you know, a joyful, it, I enjoyed doing what I came here to do with the CDCI because it made me feel wanted. Uh, it made me feel like I was a part of something bigger. It made me feel like I can actually make positive change in someone else's life, which is hard to come by in a small rural state of Vermont. For me, it's just, you know, being a part of something, you know, that I can contribute to, that I can, that I, feel, I have a sense of belonging, 
and understand other people, you know, aspects, views of where they're coming from and actually seeing, they're seeing their stories at hand, you know, in their communities. I see it in my community, but I also see it throughout Vermont statewide. It's a, the picture is very, very clear for me. It really is. And I see a collaboration of us all coming from different sectors of Vermont, not only getting down to the nitty gritty of why the system's so inaccessible, um, plain, white, old, is breaking apart. Its infrastructure in itself is breaking apart. And uh, coming together is we're actually realizing that, you know what, that this system was not meant with accessibility. It was meant for one-sided. And we're seeing that now. All of us are seeing it now. We're saying that this system is needs to go. There's no if, ands, or buts. It needs to go. Because it helps everybody else out, not just us with disabilities, but helps our community members. So without disabilities too as well, because most of those without disabilities understand the system is still complex to navigate. And if it's, and if it's hard for them to navigate, what about us that, are, that are, have disabilities? It makes us times two, times three harder to navigate. So being involved in this process not only helps me and individuals like me, or within a group like me with disabilities, but it helps other peers that without disabilities to understand that, hey, we're fixing a system that your government, your chancellor, your president didn't want, want didn't want to partake in. And uh, me being on this team has opened my eyes up to seeing a system more clear than it has ever, you know, has didn't have ever has before. <laughs> I actually can see the system of, you know, that it's telling me that there's a lot of problems still in here that no one has touched because they're either they're afraid to, don't have enough time to, or they take a lot of backlashing to because it makes that environment unfriendly because in any type of world, you're trying to, you're trying to better not understand the system, but you're trying to do, trying to be a better, uh, better advocate, but not also trying to do better for other communities that need extra help. And there's people out there that think of themselves. And that's wrong. They should think about others. And um, to me, it's like, I don't think about myself to get ahead of others. That's what the state is doing to the state. They're thinking about themselves to get ahead. It hasn't worked out in a way that they love to perceive to hope for. It hasn't worked out. And when you're trying to get ahead, you make mistakes. And when you make mistakes, everybody suffers from them. And uh, to me, it's like, I want to do this the, on the first time, not the second time around, because that tells you how clear I want you to understand how a system's going to be simplified in a way where it makes sense for you and your family members, your community members, you as an individual, yourself. How can I make this system more sense to you and your way of thinking? Not what the state says, but in your way of thinking. I see myself better than I ever could be, but also what can I be do? What can I do? with myself that could bring positive outcome. What thing that I can do that's so special to you that I can bring out positive outcomes for positive community? And that is the question that I ask all the time is what can I do to bring positive outcomes, to bring positive vibes to a community that needs it right now, needs hope, needs someone to love them for who they are, not what they are. Need someone to pick them up if they fall down, to support them. And to me, it's like, I'm that person that, you know, you can talk to. I'm approachable because I see the problems you go through. I live through them. I experience through them. 
I know how you feel because I've been through it. How can I help you cope and navigate the system together? Not just with me, but with communities like me that feel the same way of, you know, the oppression. Um, being forgotten purposely. Um, being left out of things, you know, when you're not supposed to be. Because to me, it's like, if you're a voting member of the public, then you deserve to be there. there there's no if, ands, or buts about it. You're supposed to be there. It just... Vermont has its way of, you know, looking at a different view, different view than what it should be looking at. And that's a view that I despise the most because it's basically turning community member versus community member away from each other, but also away from the actual goal we're trying to achieve here. And, and it's basically diversity, inclusion, acceptance. Acceptance is the top comes in mind because that meaning everybody is included no matter what the background is. But thank you for answering that question. It was a, a pretty tough one. Yeah, I've been asking a lot of tough questions, Matthew, and I do appreciate how approachable and easy to talk to you are. Um, and I, I know that the work that you do is really to serve the community and to work to change our systems, to be more inclusive um, and more accessible. Please. To the service community as a whole. I don't see it one way or another. And um, it's not just UVM ecosystem. It's not just that. It's something more. I'm looking at for something more. I'm looking for the state to actually get on board with this because it's, you know, because to me, it's like, I see that if the state got on board, then this, these problems would disappear automatically, instantaneously disappear because that's where it should have been from the beginning. But the reason why we got here in this position was nobody wants to touch it with a 10 foot pole. Nobody wants to, nobody wants to help out with accessibility because they don't think that they can have it. They don't think that they're going to be disabled. People out here in Vermont think that they're not going to have a disability. In life, you're going to have a disability sooner or later. And you're going to need those services to work for you. So you can't deny or have a notion of dismissing that altogether. It could be you get hit by a car by accident. Oh, you're disabled. Congratulations, you're disabled. And you may not know about that. that you may not may not need that service until, ooh, I may just need a service, you know. I didn't know that I really did this damaging. I didn't support this, but I now I know why did people want to support it because this will really help me. And um, that's the way I look at it is, you know, is of, you know, what you asked me, just, I guess, you know, it's a very tiring question in general, not, not in a way of you look at it as, it's a very tiring question, tiring question in general, because it's, it's, it's the stuff that I do day by day. And it's very, very, it ain't just advocacy. Some days I'm actually on other commissions that I'm leading just by myself for the state of Vermont in some ways. Sometimes days I'm on, on national conferences that I'm representing the city of Vermont by myself. And, you know, and that's hard. That's hard to put yourself out there. It's hard to do that type of work because, you know, what you're doing in reality is making you not only your life better, but other people's life better too as well. And for me, it's just, you know, that's the reason why I do the hard work is to make sure everybody's life is better. And that's the reason why I like to collaborate, have other, you know, universities collaborate with us because they get it. They understand it. If we collaborate, then everybody, then everybody deserves a little, you know, relief. And that's how I like it is, you know, if we collaborate, then we survive and we win. And that's what I would like to see moving forward. But thank you again for answering that question. <laughs> So that's a perfect transition because I wanted to end by asking you a little bit about your hopes for the future. Um, so I guess my last question is what is next for you? What would you like to, to be doing in the next couple of years? Oh, that's a tricky question because in the next couple of years, 
we don't know what uh, my my life, your life, everybody's life in Vermont set in stone yet. That's an uncharted territory. That question is uncharted territory. We do not know where we're going from here on out. That's one question. But where I want to see, and I have a notion of what I want to see is more of this collaboration. Collaboration, cooperative networking, you know, not within the UVM network, but all sides of Vermont, you know, to actually have that collaboration work that I want to see or be more involved in because to me, it's like having that is actually the big key of for a small state to survive. And small states across this great nation of the United States of America have a hard time understanding that cooperativeness and collaboration is key, one of the big keys of surviving or, or survivability of the state. And if we can't have that, then there's no, one, there's no point of talking about it. Two, we have failed our constituents and failed the communities that live here. And three, we have failed together as a state. And uh, to me, it's like what I hope for for the future, that with optimistic, you know, and what I want to see is continue this collaboration effort with other networks, you know, other community members, other partnerships, other organizations that really want to see this go forward, but also are they willing to step out and say, hey, can you help me with this? Because I see this the same as you're in your community, that you're also having the same problem as I am with equity, with inclusion, with diversity, with acceptance, you know, can you help me or do you have any ideas to share with me to, to, so I can, you know, not only succeed in the progress of what I want to see or my goals, achieve them, those goals and the goals and missions that I set out for, how can I actually truly collaborate, you know, together in a way that brings positivity, optimistic, hopefulness, um, determination. How can we all come together to make sure that one goal, that one mission, that one statement, that one, that one, they call it one silver bullet, but to me it's like that one star moving forward. How can we all get on that star together and write it so we can achieve to where we need to achieve our goals and our missions together. And we need to change the narrative very, very quickly and say, there are progress moving forward. It just, you know, it takes a lot of people to voice that same voice together to make that progress achievable. And what I have hoped for, for my job in the coming year, you know, it's to continue the work that I've done now. It's just, you know, like I said, tomorrow we'll see. Um, literally been asked to be a part of Vermont Department of Health Task Force, which is to be determined, which is, you know, is an honor in itself because the Vermont Department of Labor knows what I'm doing. I mean, they, they know someone's taking it seriously. And I got to take it seriously then who is going to if I don't take this seriously? Who is going to be to take the next step and take it seriously? That's the question that I'm asking. Who else is going to take this seriously if, if I can't? The reason why I'm taking this seriously in, in my work across the state because it's the survivability of the state in itself. We can't survive if we can't collaborate together. Thank you for answering the question. Did I answer any other questions that you want me to answer more? Or is this, yeah. you know, enough, more than enough, plenty? <laughs> no, or... you did such a great job today. Thank you so much, Matthew, for all of your time and for taking all the questions so seriously. I really appreciate all the um, the thoughtful the thoughtful answers that you gave. And I know they were no, hard. No, no, yeah, no. Andrea, it's, you know, the, thank you for answering to invite me is these some of these are have to be taken seriously as no one takes us seriously then what are we doing here and um to me it's i do like, have one more question for you yeah. though how do you relax <laughs> what do you do to relax <laughs> my 
Uh, this one thing that everybody asks me, which I have a difficult time answering, I can't relax when my job is not done yet. I, I, I will relax when my job is done, when I'm done making sure everybody's accommodation needs are met. And to me, it's like, we can't relax now. We get, if we, there's a saying, it's if we relax now, then we're going to get, then we're going to get into that. Then we're going to get so relaxed that we're not going to be able to continue on doing much of anything. Or we're going to get behind on what we do and um, we want to continue it. So for me, my relaxation is continue the tough work, continue to fight, continue doing what's right for individuals that need that, you know, extra support. And, you know, there are some times I lay lay back and listen to music, but to me, it's like I'm always on the go. I can't stop to relax because if I get into that, relaxing relaxation phase then i'll never could be able to continue the goal that i set out for myself and i'll never forgive myself if i know that any individual access needs are not met and it's just you know that's how i look at things it's you know what it's i can't relax it's not a time for relax it's time to continue the fight that you started because that fight is for accessibility that fight is for inclusion. That fight is for transparency. That fight is for acceptance of the individual and a sense of belonging of why they love and live in Vermont. And so I can't relax because I care too much about where the state is going. And it's just who I am. It's just, you know, I do relax from now on time here and there but pretty much I'm on the go 24-7, literally. If I'm not on one thing, I'm on something else. And what I do is very, very tiresome work. But I do know at the end of the day, your access need will be met sooner or later. And it will be met. Hopefully. I have optimism. My work is going to bring fruitful progress across Vermont statewide. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today, Matthew. If um, anyone who's listening would like to get in touch with you or follow your work, what is the best way for them to contact you? Yeah, they can email me, you know, if they have any more questions or concerns, you know, or just want to get to know me uh, and my work. Um, and, you know, if they really want to get to know me, it's how I do things across the state. I mean, some of the, some of the stuff I will ask them is, yes, some of these some of these commission are not like disability commission. These are state state commissions and some of them and some of the systems in there are not easy to to comprehend. Because even for me, I'm trying to still comprehend some of the systems, what they're trying to ask them to do. And it's not easy trying to comprehend something that wasn't built or designed for us that need little extra support. It was built for one specific reason and it was built for one specific way and it was built for one specific culture of Vermont and I can tell you this it's not the culture that I want to see it's still portraying that white heritage across the state of Vermont and it should never be that you know but Vermont still can't come to reality that that's what's hurting everybody is keeping that tradition, that system the same, instead of trying to actually call it out for what it is and actually try to make positive change within that system. And that's how I look at it is, unless someone actually gets up there and changes it, goes up there and says, calls it out for what it is, I don't think Vermont's ever gonna change unless they call it out for what it is. That's when we start to change. That's when we start to positive change when somebody straight up calls it out for what it is.